Live from KSAT 12, the 6 o'clock news starts right now. And we begin tonight with a health alert. If your family's been hit with a stomach bug recently, chances are it's the highly contagious norovirus. One school now reporting a student and teacher have been hospitalized with that virus. Courtney Friedman tells us about a recent spike in cases and what other serious illness has similar symptoms you should watch out for. Norovirus, a nasty stomach bug that's extremely contagious. Causes symptoms like vomiting, diarrhea, some stomach pain, sometimes fevers. Dr. Robert Sanders is the associate medical director at University Health's PD Express Clinic, and he's been seeing a big spike in norovirus cases. That usually happens in the winter time, but as this graph shows, the virus is making an unusual round this spring. Parents we've talked to say it's been pretty rampant in daycares, but we checked in with school districts too. SAISD and South San ISD both reported normal absence numbers due to stomach-related illnesses. NISD did report absences of both students and staff due to a stomach bug. And NEISD reports higher numbers of elementary school students absent with GI symptoms, but says cases seem to be declining. Public Charter School District Jubilee Academies reported in the last week the district has had 37 students and 25 staff with GI symptoms. One staff member and one student, both with confirmed norovirus, are hospitalized. Especially with COVID, we are used to using hand sanitizer at all times, but the thing with norovirus, alcohol does not kill it. So the best thing you can do is use good old fashioned soap and water. If you get norovirus, stay hydrated. If the vomiting persists and they're just not able to keep fluids down, or they have signs of dehydration, we want to see them. If their mouth is dry or they're not making saliva or tears, those are concerns. If they're not urinating on a regular basis. He's also reminding parents about a global hepatitis outbreak in kids. Both hepatitis A and norovirus cause very similar symptoms. A big difference, norovirus only lasts two to three days. Well, hepatitis is something that will last longer that will have a little more severe symptoms. And then the most important thing is that you might see yellowing of the eyes or the skin. That's called jaundice. And if you see it, head to the doctor immediately. Courtney Friedman, KSAT 12 News. It's tonight a deadly shooting outside a sports bar under investigation. It happened around two this morning outside the Perfect Score Sports Cantina in the 6400 block of Northwest Loop 410. San Antonio police say an officer heard gunfire taking place between several people. Officers say a man in his 30s actually outside of the bar when he was caught in the crossfire. Police say he tried to take cover, but was shot and killed. SAPD says no suspects are in custody. They will be using surveillance video to help in this investigation. We have learned the name of a man hit and killed by a car over the weekend. According to the Bear County Medical Examiner's Office, 56 year old Rudy Rene Medellin was killed after being hit by a vehicle. This happened Saturday around six in the morning at the intersection of Calabria Road and Northwest 36th Street. Police say the driver who hit him did stop to help. Medellin was pronounced dead there at the scene. No other details about what happened have been released. More money for more help. Bear County Sheriff Javier Salazar says he needs more deputies on the streets to combat a spike in crime in growing areas of Bear County. The sheriff wrote a letter to county commissioners on Friday asking for funding for 12 more deputies and five criminal investigators to handle violent crimes. The sheriff said there's been a rise in crimes, especially when it comes to stolen weapons. In that letter, the sheriff referenced an unsolved string of car break ins in West Bear County in April, where the suspects were openly carrying guns in Alamo Ranch neighborhoods. People are leaving guns in cars. People are getting their guns stolen out of cars, and then those guns are being in turn used to commit violent crimes. The sheriff told us he hopes to meet with county commissioners in the next few weeks before that budget is presented. A task force that was created to protect the elderly in Bear County has made great strides in the past two years. The focus of the group was to make sure that crimes committed against the elderly didn't fall through the cracks. Erica Hernandez talked with those on the elderly abuse task force about how part of their focus is making sure that all of us are educated. Texas Senator Jose Menendez, along with probate court two judge Veronica Vasquez, saw a need two years ago to protect the elderly in Bear County. We have seen continuously that we're usually ranked second under Harris County for elder abuse and exploitation and for um, cases that are reported to adult protective services as well. In those two years, much has been done. The district attorney's office now has a DA dedicated to elder abuse cases. Adult protective services have hired more investigators 
A geriatric neurologist is now on the board, as well as local financial institutions to help catch financial abuse. So what's next for this task force? Well, the work isn't over. They still have goals they want to meet as the amount of reports of elderly abuse continue to be called in. The next step is legislation. Already some bills have passed on protecting the elderly, but now Senator Menendez wants to make sure there aren't any loopholes to the laws. I had filed Senate Bill 2037 in order to create add a definition of exploitation. We are looking forward to tighten those loopholes. And also educating the public has become a focus. It is mandatory to report cases of abuse or suspected cases of abuse to adult protective services. Even if you suspect something and you, you wind up not reporting it, that can lead to uh, misdemeanor charges or whatever it may be. So people really need to understand that there are serious consequences to not actually reporting these types of crimes. While elderly abuse cases won't just go away, the goal is to continue to protect. What we want is to be so aggressive with protecting elderly that we uh, show the rest of the state and the nation that we're going to prosecute people. Erica Hernandez, KSAT 12 News. It's been nearly three months since a huge infant formula recall made an existing shortage a whole lot worse. And still, this is what so many store shelves look like. These are worrisome times for parents like Emily Clayton. She says right now she has about a week's worth of formula to feed her baby son. She drives from store to store, looks online, has family searching, and she finally turned to social media, which she says is hit and miss. Sometimes I don't either have the money to pay for it in cash or I don't know if it's a scam. There's been a lot of that going on on Facebook where moms will sell formula and then not ship it to other moms or they'll sell it for a really jacked up price and try to make a profit off of it. So it's it's been a real struggle. Manufacturers say they are producing as much as they can, but there's no indication yet just how long this critical shortage will last. The Food and Drug Administration says it's making infant formula a high priority. For now, the experts advice be flexible on brands, check with your pediatrician or your local WIC office, and do not try to make your own or dilute formula. Let's take a look outside right now. Another warm day out there, 91 degrees at the moment. Curious how that humidity is doing. Am I too optimistic in thinking there was a small break in it today? I Yes. Teeny, yeah, <laughs> basically, yeah. Uh -huh, you were a little optimistic, but in the days ahead, especially I think Thursday through the weekend, we'll have more of a break from the humidity just during the afternoon hour. So that's something positive to look forward to. 96 was our high temperature today. Good 11 degrees above average and two degrees shy of the record high. No triple digits on the map in our area, but Catula, Carrizo Springs were both 99, so not far from it. Pleasanton, 98. Hondo had a high temperature of 97. Right now, most of us still in the low to mid 90s. Catula 95, Kerrville 92 degrees, 91 officially at the airport in town in Holotus 89, Converse 88. A few thunderstorms in specific parts of our area this evening into tonight. We're going to talk more about that in just a bit. I'll hold on to that optimism. Thanks, Adam. All right, let's take a look at traffic out there right now. The northwest side of town, I 10 at Callahan. Really, not too many traffic tie ups to tell you about. Looks there, the far lanes we can see headed towards the 410 interchange. That's always backed up, so no real significant issues out there that drivers are dealing with. And from I-10, we're going to move to I-35. It remains a major gateway on San Antonio's northeast side, but as the city continues to grow, so does the congestion there. TxDOT plans to address that problem with a $1.5 billion project. It's expected to span 20 miles. So in this Traffic Authority report, Stephen Cavazos with how this will take drivers to some new levels. Well, it's been almost a decade in the making, but work on the I-35 Northeast expansion project is expected to begin soon. And although it will take several years to complete, TxDOT officials say this project will offer relief to drivers down the road. Now, the goal is to improve safety and mobility, but also address the increase of traffic in the area. Now, over the course of construction, crews will create elevated lanes to help reduce travel times. Now, these lanes will be created between the main lanes and frontage roads. HOV lanes will also be added for vehicles that have two 
or more people, such as buses or carpools. Now, this project will span roughly 20 miles from North Walter Street to FM 1103. That's three counties, including Bear, Guadalupe, and Comal. According to TxDOT, the NEX project will also provide flyover ramps to Loop 1604 West and 410 North. Laura Lopez with TxDOT reminds drivers to be patient during this process. People just don't like construction, unfortunately, but in order for us to help the congestion that there is today, we need to build this project now. This will help to reduce a lot of the congestion that we see now. Now, there will be several lane closures taking place over the course of construction, but the main lanes of I-35 should remain as is. Now, this project will be done in phases. A groundbreaking ceremony is planned Wednesday morning for the central project, which spans from the I-35 Loop 410 interchange right here all the way up over here to FM 1103. Now, keep in mind, that's roughly about nine miles. And of course, we will be there at that groundbreaking ceremony and we'll bring you more information in the days ahead. Reporting in the traffic lab, Stephen Cavazzo. KSAT 12 News. Back to you. Thank you, Stephen. Coming up, we're going to introduce you to an award winning author who will be featured at this year's San Antonio Book Festival. That story after the break. That investigation, one of the more than 60 murders reported in San Antonio this year, the dangerous trend that could be contributing to the problem and why it's getting harder to stop. Those stories and more tonight on the Night Beat at 10. She is a mom, a teacher, and author. And later this month, she will represent the Alamo City. Marcia Argetta Mickelson is among the 90 authors attending the 10th annual San Antonio Book Festival at the Central Library and Southwest School of Art. And Marcia spoke with our Stefania Jimenez about her latest award winning book and explained why it's so relevant. It's about a young woman who's a senior in high school. Her name is Milagros Vargas. She likes to go by Millie. Her family came to the United States as undocumented immigrants. That's the premise for Marsha Argueta Mickelson's latest book, Where I Belong. The story's themes are universal. At the center is Millie, a Guatemalan American teenager living in Corpus Christi, struggling to find her place. I'm at Cole Park in Corpus Christi, Texas, and this is one of Millie's favorite places. Her mother works for a wealthy family, Mr. Wheeler. He's running to be senator in Texas, and one evening when he's talking about how he wants to help immigrants, he uses Millie and her family as an example of immigrants who came to the United States, worked hard, and now she's about to go to Stanford University with a full right scholarship. So he kind of puts her in the spotlight, which is the last place she ever wanted to be. So she's kind of being pushed now to be a voice um, for the issue, but at the same time she's receiving online threats and being harassed on social media, so she has to kind of decide um, make a choice what she wants to do. In some ways, Millie's story gives you a glimpse into the author's own backstory. My family came to the United States as undocumented immigrants, and my sister was born here in the United States, so I kind of did feel like I didn't quite belong here, but I never lived in Guatemala, so I never felt like I really belonged there either. And like her character, Marsha found her way. The wife and mom of three is also an elementary school teacher and accomplished author. Where I Belong, her fifth book book is a recipient of the Pura Belpre Award, a distinction given to Latino or Latina writers who celebrate Latino experiences in youth literature. As a teacher, I just want to spend most of my time just creating and doing things for young people because I just feel like, you know, they are our future and I just feel like there's so much that we can teach them or that so many messages that are important for them to learn. Marsha's leading by example. She says that her book took her 10 years to write, and she hopes that her story inspires other young people to follow their dreams. You could meet Marsha during the San Antonio Book Festival. It takes place on May 21st. Sifania Jimenez, KSAT 12 News. All right, let's turn to the weather now. It's dropped a whole degree. I'm optimistic about <laughs> wow. that too. You are very <laughs> optimistic today. You know, I'm trying to spread it around. Is it working? Yeah. 
No. A yeah. little bit. Yeah. Give it time. Give it time. Okay. Uh, rest I'm of smiling at your optimism. Yeah. <laughs> that's something. Yeah. Hey, we like the optimism, that's for sure. And I wish we were a little more optimistic about rain chances as a whole, but unfortunately, we just can't be. A few border storms this evening, closer to the Rio Grande. Otherwise, uh, we're still looking dry here for uh, at least a seven day stretch, and temperatures staying above average by about 10 to 14 degrees. All right, let's get right to the radar. Take a look at the activity that's in. Parts of Mexico, especially the mountains of Mexico at this moment, and even West Texas. Parts of Big Bend National Park actually getting some much needed soaking rainfall from some thunderstorms. We're anticipating more development here west of Val Verde County already uh, close to the Rio Grande. A little bit of activity. This is just north of Comstock and more development is likely in the coming hours. And I do think some of it's going to be drifting across the Rio Grande. Now, here's a big picture. You see this big yellow box there that indicates the severe thunderstorm watch, meaning conditions are favorable for strong to severe thunderstorms. That's in West Texas, but also does go right into Val Verde County. Does it go eastward? We're not expecting anything even close to San Antonio. One reason being upper level high pressure system deflecting it around us, basically going to weaken everything before it makes it here. These storms will just have a really hard time surviving their trek eastward, and we think they'd really fizzle out by about Lakey, Uvalde, Carrizo Springs area. So here's the latest. We talked about the development here that's likely to continue over the next few hours and you look at the future cast and it's an agreement that you know you get to nine o'clock some storms popping up in Val Verde County at 10 o'clock just moving eastward but then watch this midnight 1 a.m. see that action just has a hard time uh, making its way anywhere east of Highway 83. So from about Rock Springs, Lakey to Uvalde, Carrizo Springs, uh, Crystal City, I think that's our limit eastward from the Rio Grande where those showers are going to make it. But we're seeing the blow off cloud cover already from those storms in Mexico. You look outside, you look off to the west, that thin veil of clouds, so high thunderstorm clouds being blown our way from the upper level winds. 91 right now, dew point of 70, feels like 97 degrees. At least it's not 100. Myra, there's the optimism. At least it's not 100. Oh, if it's rubbing yeah. off. No, I'm, I'm feeling it now. I'm definitely yeah. feeling it. It's and working. It's working. <laughs> 74, it's contagious. So 74 degrees now in Alpine. I point that out because West Texas, deep into drought. I mean, West Texas can often be dry, but they actually had some rain cooled air there. So Alpine at 74, and I think they picked up about 15 hundredths of an inch of rain from those storms. 90s around here, low to mid 90s for most of us. 95 Castroville. Canyon Lake down to 86, Seguin 88, comfort now at 90 degrees. Tomorrow morning, pretty uneventful, just very sticky and humid with the low gray clouds to start the day. Most of us lower 70s. We think in San Antonio, even about 75. Gray overcast early by the noon hour. We get into the sunshine, 87 degrees at noon, and then 95 for the high temperature. We hit that around 4 and 5 p.m. tomorrow afternoon with a lot of sunshine later in the day. And we do think we'll be just below 100 uh, south and west of San Antonio and closer to the Rio Grande tomorrow afternoon. Most of us in the mid 90s for high temperatures. The rest of the week, very similar, pretty much just repetitive into the weekend. We do tack on a few degrees this weekend and those high temperatures in the mid, maybe upper 90s, Saturday, Sunday and Monday. That's record challenging territory. And I do want to point out total lunar eclipse Sunday night should be visible. Some high thin clouds possible. Totality begins at 1029. We'll talk more about that as the week goes on and we get closer to it. That's exactly what I was thinking. Adam's going to have a lot more to say. Oh, you know, <laughs> in yeah. the days ahead. Thanks, Adam. All right. You know, just like Myra's optimism was infectious, you know, when the Spurs won their world championships, Greg. Yep. Peter Holt's enthusiasm for this team was it infectious. You're talking about Peter M. Holt. Yes. Now his son Peter J. Holt runs the Spurs. In fact, he's the managing partner of Spurs Sports and Entertainment. But he sent out a letter today to calm the fears or maybe more likely the concerns of Spurs fans who believe they may be leaving San Antonio after their request to play as many as eight home games away from the AT&T Center. We have excerpts of that for you when we come back. And the blockbuster contract that's waiting for Tom Brady when he finally decides to retire from the NFL. Coming up. 
Sports and Entertainment managing partner Peter J. Holt releasing a letter to the city of San Antonio today following the team's request to play eight home games away from the AT&T Center over the next two seasons. That included four in Austin. The request raised concerns that the team's ownership group was testing the waters about possibly moving the franchise out of San Antonio since over 30 percent of the team's ownership has been sold to outside investors, including billionaire Michael Dell in Austin. That request was later reduced to a 3-2 vote by the commissioner's court to just four games next season, including two in Austin. Today's letter to San Antonio by Holt was to calm the concerns of Spurs fans, and it read, in part, I love you, I love this city, a big city with a casual small-town feel and a great basketball team. I want to reassure you that the Spurs are in San Antonio to stay. My family became involved in the Spurs in the 90s because there was a real threat that the team would be moved. We would not let that happen then. We will not let that happen now. There are no Spurs without the city and people of San Antonio. Your team, our team together, we are the silver and black Spurs fans. We are here to stay for Vida. Now, the Spurs have explained their request to play those games away from the AT&T Center was to help expand their fan base from Mexico along the I-35 corridor all the way up to Austin. In the four that have been tentatively approved for next season won't be played in Mexico, one in the Alamo Dome as part of the team's 50th anniversary celebration, and next season, and two in Austin. Pro football coverage, powered by Davis Law Firm. Another day, another release, a part of the 2022 NFL season to come. Today, it's Christmas Day. CBS announcing the defending Super Bowl champion, Los Angeles Rams will host Russell Wilson and the Denver Broncos at 3.30 p.m. San Antonio time on Christmas Day. This coming off Sean McVay becoming the youngest coach in NFL history at 36 to win the Vince Lombardi Trophy. And after the Broncos came up with the biggest offseason acquisition on the field by grabbing Wilson, of course, Russell Wilson, who wants to help in Denver's six year playoff drought. And when seven time Super Bowl champion Tom Brady finally decides, does decide to hang up his cleats, he'll have a very nice deal waiting for him as a broadcaster. After losing both Troy Aikman and Joe Buck to ESPN's Monday Night Football booth, Fox believes they have made up for it by inking Brady to a 10 year deal. And according to the New York Post, it's worth $375 million. That's the biggest payday in sports broadcasting history that averages out to $37.5 million a year, more than double of what both Troy Aikman and Tony Robo make in a single season combined. Now, one of the biggest offseason moves by UT head football coach Steve Sarkeesian was to hire former Dallas Cowboys running back to Shard Choice to help improve the Longhorns' rushing attack. Choice played four seasons with the Cowboys after Dallas made him a fourth-round pick in 2008 NFL Draft before playing for the Commanders, that's Washington, Bills, and Colts. He has spent the last three seasons as a running backs coach at his alma mater, Georgia Tech, before he was hired by Sark and is also one heck of a recruiter. During his appearance in San Antonio Quarterback Club on Monday, Sark was asked what choice will he bring, what choice will bring to the 40 acres. I think he's got some really good roots in, in Texas now with his time with the Cowboys, his time coaching high school football in the state of Texas, and his time coaching at North Texas. So the reality of it is I think this is he's always held the University of Texas in high regard, and he's been a great addition. I mean, this guy is a great coach, great mentor, unbelievable energy, and, and we're, we're lucky to have him. And after finishing 5-7 and seven, his first season, Sark looking to turn the program around, opening the 2022 season at home against Louisiana Monroe. And guess who they have in their second game of the season at home? Alabama. Al Alabama. <laughs> Boom. Hello. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Greg. All right. Coming up, we're talking live music in San Antonio. Is the Alamo City overlooked? We're going to talk about that in our Q&A next. In today's KSAP Q&A, we're talking about something you've probably experienced. You see, one of your favorite bands, artists, is coming to uh, going on tour, but not necessarily coming to San Antonio. You check out the dates. We're not on there. Austin, Houston, Dallas, they may be part of that schedule, but why not us? So in today's KSAT Q&A, we are joined by Nicholas Frank, the arts and culture reporter for the San Antonio Report. You just did a big piece on this looking at the reasons historically that San Antonio misses out on some live music. Let's start there. What is it about us? Why don't we end up on that schedule? Well, talk to any longtime San Antonian, and they will tell you that San Antonio has been known as a heavy metal city. And that was definitely true 20, 30 years ago, and it's less true today, but that reputation has sort of stuck with the city, that it's maybe not as open to other genres of music, other than country music, obviously, and Latin touring acts. Um, but for indie pop um, and rock, maybe not so much. So it's taken a decade, maybe two, to really start turning that around and attracting 
uh, touring acts to our city. You know, even when you talk, you, you, yeah, a thrasher city, a heavy metal city is what San Antonio has been known as. But even those acts don't seem to be coming to San Antonio. I mean, there used to be a, a heavy metal fest that was in the parking lot of the AT&T Center. It was canceled a few years ago and hasn't been replaced by anything of note. I mean, it, it, it seems as if it almost is across the board, San Antonio not landing some of these big touring acts. I think you're right. I think it's the economics of the music industry uh, on a larger scale around the country that maybe is pushing some of those acts to smaller venues and whether San Antonio can still provide the audiences that those acts need. It comes down to economics for a lot of bands. And you touched on that in your article, which I thought was really interesting, that when you look at advanced ticket sales, there is a big difference in the audience for that in San Antonio versus in Austin, for example. So is there, when it comes to economics, maybe the makeup of a, of a crowd like San Antonio could provide versus Dallas or Austin? Is that a big reason that some of these shows don't happen here? Yeah, definitely. Several of the knowledgeable promoters and agencies that I spoke with for the article said that San Antonio is notorious for not uh, providing advanced ticket sales, which is what gives those promoters and bands confidence that they can sell out their shows here, or at least make enough money you know, to pay their musicians, pay their crew and keep touring. Um, and that doesn't mean that audiences won't show up. And say Chad Carey, who owns the Paper Tiger, which is an independent music club on the St. Mary's Strip, he said that people will show up. They'll show up on the day of the show and largely make up the hopes of the promoters to fill that club. Um, he also said that in a recent show, the Brian Jonestown Massacre came through town and he said he would have liked to sell about 150 more tickets to that show, but that you treat that band well they have a good experience in San Antonio and they'll want to come back. Even talk about some of the bigger the bigger acts. I mean, I, do you think the image of San Antonio is changing? I mean, we just had the Smashing Pumpkins that were out at the uh, at, out at the tech center. They sold that place out. And, uh, you know, the lead singer had a Spurs hat on, was promoting what a great time he had in San Antonio. Is that what needs to happen or you know, promoters? They seem to be fewer and fewer and bigger and bigger promoters. Is San Antonio kind of stuck in this uh, rut right now when it comes to live music? You make two excellent points, Steve. Um, yes, there, there's a promotion issue with larger conglomerates, uh, touring promoters taking charge of bands and really directing them to specific cities, maybe to help maximize profits or to direct them to specific venues. But um, I spoke with Aaron Zimmerman, who's the vice president uh, for programming for the Tobin Center for the Performing Arts and also Tobin Entertainment, very knowledgeable about the scene here. And he mentioned the Smashing Pumpkins, Tobin Entertainment brought them here and he said the show was fantastic. It was packed. Um, like he said, it was sold out and that will, you know, San Antonio's charm, the Spurs will also bring bands like that back. Those bands will tell their friends and as Aaron said in the article, things are changing and they're changing fast. I want to make sure people go to the San Antonio report dot org and take a look at that article because there's a lot more in it that we can't cover in five or six minutes. And, uh, you know, it's fascinating. Yeah, things are definitely changing for the better. It seems like Nicholas Frank, thanks so much for being here and sharing some information with us. By the way, Nicholas, before you go, I yeah. want your background is interesting. You're an art curator for a museum. You were an independent, you toured with a band. Uh, mm -hmm. You're originally from Milwaukee. I mean, you were, you were kind of like, you know, such a diverse background yourself, and we're happy to welcome you to San Antonio. Oh, thanks, Steve. I appreciate that so much. I feel very welcome here. Everyone says it's a great town, and I agree. Thanks, Stephen Meyer. All right, we'll have you back sometime. You take care. We'll be right back. Wildfires throughout New Mexico continue to grow as extreme fire conditions fuel the spread of those massive flames. Crews battling a dangerous mix of powerful winds, low humidity, and high temperatures. And now there is growing concern that weather conditions could quickly change and impact containment efforts. Mike Valero with the latest. 
this fire is still extremely dangerous. Powerful winds, high temperatures, and low humidity, a dangerous mix that's fueling several wildfires in New Mexico. We're seeing flames from a house probably two, 300 feet in the air, and it was roaring like a freight train. The so-called Calf Canyon Hermit's Peak Fire is now the second largest wildfire on record in New Mexico. So far, it's charred more than 200,000 acres, an area nearly the size of New York City. The monster wildfire is a combination of two fires burning out of control, which have triggered evacuation orders and have destroyed many homes. So you cry and you feel all this emotion and then it's going to be hard because you think you're dealing with it right now. But I, I can guarantee you that I know when I get there and I see it for myself, all that is going to come again. While some evacuation orders have been lifted, officials warn conditions may worsen and are urging people to stay vigilant. The National Weather Service in Albuquerque says wind gusts could pick up Tuesday afternoon and predict the hot and dry windy conditions could continue through Thursday. We've got a historic wind event. Um, and several red flag days, which really mean that the weather is creating extreme fire risk. In San Jose, New Mexico, I'm Mike Valerio reporting. You know, we wish we could share some humidity. We got plenty to go around here and definitely a different scenario than some people around the country. Yeah, and but you know, Miss Optimistic today, it's already dropped. To, we're down below 90 degrees. You know, the optimism is just cranking. It is. Here today. Yes. I think the thermometer at the airport, it has rubbed off on that thermometer. <laughs> it, it, it's following suit. Yes. So today, 96 our high temperature. That was one degree lower than what we had yesterday. We were two degrees shy of the record high today. And we stayed in the upper 90s elsewhere. Catula, Carrizo Springs, 99, Pleasanton, 98, and Del Rio, 93. Those are typically the hottest spots on the map, but today, not triple digits, whereas yesterday, we did have triple digits. 91 right now, by 10 o'clock, 83 degrees, by midnight, 79. No chance of rain locally, that's different farther to the west. We're gonna take a look at the radar and talk about how far east those storms can make it in just a bit. In the buzz today, NASA could soon be sending pictures of naked earthly humans to aliens. Yes, you did hear that correctly. Researchers have put forward a proposal for a message to be transmitted from Earth out into the Milky Way in hopes that extraterrestrials will find it. Which naked earthly humans? That's my question. That the message question. plan includes representations of DNA, a map of the solar system, Oh, and illustrations of nude humans waving hi, one male and one female. The message ends with an invitation for extraterrestrials to respond using their own telescopic technology. Okay. Yeah. Dolly Parton's still working, working, working. The 9 to 5 singer <laughs> is teaming up with Taco Bell for a new musical about the chain's Mexican pizza. The Los Angeles Times reports Parton is teaming up with rapper Doja Cat and several TikTok stars for this project. Just when you think she cannot do more, Taco Bell's Mexican pizza was a fan favorite until the restaurant discontinued that in 2020. Now it's returning May 19th with a musical to boot. Mexican pizza, the musical, set to debut on TikTok May 26th. They should have called it the Mexican pizza of many colors. <laughs> That would have been amazing. Yeah. Okay, I guess I got to get on TikTok. Andy Warhol's <laughs> iconic Marilyn Monroe portrait, some of the most important works of art in the 1960s pop art movement. Well, one of the pieces just sold for a jaw-dropping $195 million, becoming the most expensive 20th century artwork ever to go on auction. The 40-inch... The 40 square inch shot sage blue Maryland was one of dozens of images Warhol made of Monroe in the 60s. The record breaking sale happened at Christie's in New York on Monday. The auction house had initially said it was expecting bids in the region of $200 million. And today is National Shrimp Day. Some countries use the word prawn to describe larger versions of the sea animal. Plenty of popular shrimp dishes nationwide. I'm gonna sound like <laughs> Forrest Gump here. Seafood gumbo, shrimp cocktail, shrimp scampi, just to name a few. I'll take it from there. Whether you like them blackened, fried, broiled, or grilled, the delicious crustacean is low calorie, high protein, and it's an option for any meal. It's also known to be good for the circulatory system. Get a little shellfish and enjoy some shrimp today. It's also really good bait. 
Let's not forget that. That's true. Great the, bait. The live shrimp. Yeah, good yeah. bait. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's what I think of when I see it out there. Eat it. Yeah, yeah. Use it to my advantage. Yeah. All right. Catch, use something small to catch something bigger. Yes. What, go after, so what go after live shrimp? Is it like redfish? Is that is that? Oh, a lot name? of them do. Yeah. yeah. A ton of, ton of, Wally? ton of them do. What? No, no. Walleye. Walleye. You mean? <laughs> no, it's walleye. not the Disney character. She always thinks that <laughs> when I talk about walleye show. fishing. <laughs> yes. I always quote Wally Wally. when he tells me about walleye. Why? Walleye, no. Yeah. The, and he doesn't they, find it funny. Leeches and minnows, they're freshwater. <laughs> now there are freshwater shrimp, and we did find a lot in Tom Lake. We set the camera down to the bottom to scope it out, and uh, we can get into that some other time. We have a lot to talk. <laughs> really cool, Wally. though. Oh, gosh. <laughs> Let's move on. <laughs> Take a look at radar. <laughs> a few lucky folks right now in Valverde County are getting in on some activities, some showers and thunderstorms, lightning, nothing severe right now, but this is the kind of action that could go severe in a moment's notice. So something we need to watch carefully and watch closely, but nothing of concern. Otherwise, just benefit really. And you look closely. This is all just outside of Comstock, about to hit Comstock, moving toward Devil's River State Nat Natural Area, uh, north of Del Rio for now, at least north, north of Lake Amistad for now as well. But this activity is basically confined to parts of Valverde County for the the moment and I do think it will hold together, make its way toward Juneau and then maybe even clip parts of Edwards County before falling apart. It's so moving to the northeast at about 25 miles per hour. So we can time out this downpour right here and uh, time that out and see when it could make it into some of these communities at Devil's River State Natural Area. It's really one of the only communities out here in this part of Valverde County. It could be there by about 731 PM. But farther south down the Devil's River, of course, we've got some communities there as well. Right now you're dry. You can see the lightning and thunder off in the distance, but that's it. You still, I do think, will be seeing some rain this evening periodically through about 11 p.m. And actually, we could have some severe storms, particularly in Valverde County. Latest future cast shows some action making it into Edwards County before dissipating and then 10, 11 o'clock, maybe even some more approaching Del Rio, Maverick County as well, Kinney County. But we really think the time frame of opportunity is mostly through about 11 p.m. And yes, this is a drought stricken part of Texas, but a good portion of Valverde County in better shape than the rest of us. You see just the moderate drought in northern Valverde County, but then you get into the Brackettville area, Lakey, Uvalde, and you get into the exceptional drought. The blow off clouds from those storms over Mexico and now the Rio Grande, they've been moving our way. So you see that thin veil of clouds off to the west right now, kind of filtering out the remaining sunlight that we have. There's that thin veil. Then we have the lower clouds that are still in place as well. 91 degrees. Let's talk temperatures. Dew point of 70. And I want to talk about dew points as well. Before we get to temperatures, dew points. Dew points lower 70s. Now we're feeling the very sticky air that's in place. That puts us in the oppressive category. But I do think the afternoons, Thursday through the weekend and even into next week, will feature lower humidity. It'll be hot but not as humid for the afternoon hours, say between about 2 p.m. and 6 p.m. Uh, Thursday through the weekend. Right now, mostly in the 90s, Del Rio 91, 86 though, Bernie Stage 87, Bulverde, Stinson 96, 95 and Hondo at this moment. Tomorrow morning, low 70s for most of us. By the afternoon, we make it back into the 90s. More of the same temperature wise, mid 90s for most of us. Low clouds early. The case at 12 hour forecast indicates that. But by the noon hour, we're back to sunshine and then mostly sunny afternoon, 95 the high temperature. And you'll notice the wind periodically southeasterly at times gusting up to 20 miles per hour. More of the same all the way through the weekend. Total lunar eclipse should be good viewing Sunday night with just some high thin clouds possible. We'll talk more about that as the week goes on. All right. Thank you, Adam. In case you missed it, coming up next.
innocent bar patron, a man in his 30s, was killed by gunfire early this morning while standing outside of a Northwest Side sports bar. A call didn't have to be made to 911. An officer was actually patrolling the parking lot at Ingram Park Mall and heard the shots across Loop 410, where two cars were shooting at each other here behind the wing stop, and they ended here at the Perfect Score Sports Cantina. Lavernia ISD will allow some staff members to carry concealed weapons on campus now. The school board voted unanimously to implement a district guardian program. That decision comes after several months of discussions with parents and students, teachers, law enforcement. Sheriff Javier Salazar said deputies need to stay a step ahead of criminals as summer approaches. He says there's been a rise in crime in parts of Bear County, specifically when it comes to stolen weapons. People are leaving guns in cars. Uh, people are getting their guns stolen out of cars, and then those guns are being in turn used to commit violent crimes. I have maybe a week left of formula left, and that's scary. Emily Clayton never dreamed she'd be desperate to find food for her baby Finley, only to find shelves like this with little to no formula. Emily turned to social media, posting her plea like so many others nationwide. She drove miles to pick up a single can. For the first time in two years, the Special Olympics is returning to Morgan's Wonderland in San Antonio. And as the people at Morgan's Wonderland gear up for this weekend, they also need some volunteers. Founder Gordon Hartman anticipating thousands of people show up to the event. To the event. He says anyone who wants to help out is encouraged to do so. <laughs> That is all our time. Keep the optimism going, and thanks so much for watching. We'll try to keep it going on the night beat at 10. <laughs> we'll see you then.